I think that if we are going to um, create a more plural society, a more generous society, it has to be, you know, from a place of historical generosity, generosity in storytelling. I think that is the basis of building broader, more generous communities. I would love it if our politicians could do that for us. I think, unfortunately, our political system, its relationship to the media, its relationship to party politics and populism and factionalism, it means it's unlikely that those capacious, generous stories will come from our politicians, but they can come from us. Sophie Loy Wilson, welcome to the Burning Archive. I'm delighted to be here, Jeff. Sophie, you're a senior lecturer in history at uh, University of Sydney and a bit of a specialist in Australia, China um, relationships and history from a really interesting uh, perspective, which I think a lot of viewers and listeners to the show will be really interested in because you sort of give a, a fresh new perspective on the sort of history of Australia, Asia or uh, Australia, China relationships. And you make it more complicated than I guess the story often is, but also I think a lot more engaging for people because you sort of talk about some of the emotional experience of that history as well. Um, but before we get too much into that, um, do you want to just say a little bit about what your expertise in um, this is and what your perspective on, on writing the history of Australia, Asia, or I guess the, the place from which you're writing this history, your personal connection to, to the issues. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, and it is a very personal um, story for me. I mean, I, I came to this as the daughter of a diplomat who uh, grew up um, in Moscow and Beijing in the 1990s and 2000s. Wow. So it's, it's, I suppose there's two parts to that context. One is that I grew up in embassies, so I was sort of, you know, an eyewitness to the work of diplomats, um, the logics of, of diplomacy, um, and, you know, the ways in which Australia was representing itself uh, to those countries at the end of, you know, the biggest story of the 21st century, which is the history of communism, and I think that the fall of communism, which is the story of our times, um, you know, really defines everything, I think. And, you know, so that context was important, kind of witnessing that, that diplomacy at that time. But the second reason why, you know, I care about all that uh, is because I met, I met a lot of people in, in, in Russia and China and my, my personal interactions with them were very much defined by geopolitics. Can I argue that all human interactions are defined by geopolitics, but I think it's different when you are in countries that have been to some extent isolated from the West and you are in those countries as a child and a teenager at a time when that isolation is melting away and particular kinds of Westernization, be it consumerism through capitalism, you know, albeit ideas about the individual mobility, you know, kind of personal wealth and aspiration are seeping into that society at that time. So I very much felt like I represented these things in those places. And when I returned to Australia working with Chinese Australians and on Chinese Australian history has allowed me to continue personalising that geopolitics, understanding how the topics that we, we see on the news, the big questions that our leaders debate around trade, around politics, around human rights, how these affect uh, our neighbours, our friends, you know, our, our, our co-workers. How do I, you know, connect the personal and the political? And so for me, um, it is a very personal story and it's a methodological question as well. That's fascinating. So you would have grown up like in embassies in Moscow and Beijing in like the the nineties. Is, is that sort of right, <laughs> roughly? Yeah, yeah. So that I mean, <laughs> what an budget. extraordinary de decade to observe in those countries. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and well, I guess you've 
also co-written this uh, fascinating essay, which is Introduction, Ruptured Histories, uh, Australia, China, Japan as part of the uh, special issue, special issue or, or the current issue of History Australia, which is looking at the Australia-Asia sort of relationships, which, are, you know, wonderful essay and very readable, highly recommend people check it out. Um, but you say there that, um, and this might be a nice launching uh, point, I guess, for the discussion is, a question now haunts the Australian imagination. Was the era of Australian engagement with Asia from the 1970s to 2000s an aberration from a longer historical experience? Um, and I might just say, hold back on what you say that longer historical experience is just to keep people intrigued. But um, I think a lot of people are feeling that at, at the moment too. There's this sort of disappointment, I guess, amongst a lot of people that we seem to have gone back into uh, the sort of, you know, the, the, the articles that were in the, um, in the press late last year about the, the red threat from China and <laughs> some very, very um, sort of hostile rhetoric. Um, but w what have you observed, I guess, in the way in which that question is actually haunting people at the moment, the way in which uh, this seems to be a, um, difficulties, I guess, particularly in the Australia-China relationship, but I guess more broadly Australia and the many other countries of Asia as well? Oh, that's a wonderful question, Jeff. Yeah. I mean, I think to answer it, I'm going to answer it in, in two ways. <laughs> uh, I have a, a kind of blunt, uh, you know, explanation, but I also have an explanation uh, that explains a little bit of, of, of the thinking behind my colleague, Andrew Levitas and, and my approach, um, you know, in, in that introduction. And that's a line um, from, from Andrew Levitas. He wrote, he wrote that line. So both of us uh, are in our 40s. Um, we grew up in that time of relative optimism around Australia-Asia relations. We both rode the wave of that optimism. Uh, he spent many, many years in Japan. It's a graduate of, of Kyoto University in, in history in Japanese. He speaks Japanese fluently. I spent many, many years in China. This was a time when gaining knowledge about East Asia, China, Japan, was seen as lucrative. So very much the, the narrative was um, learn languages, get rich, if you like. Uh, you know, it was a, a, there was a time where, you know, for, for Japan in the 80s, I would say, uh, and, 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 and China in the 90s, 2000s, these countries represented an accelerated you know, kind of hyper-capitalism um, and hyper-modernity, if, if you like, associated sometimes with images of the film Blade Runner, right? And so, so for, for Andrew and I as young people acquiring knowledge about Asia, this was in, in a time where this was completely part of the zeitgeist of Australia. Uh, and certainly we would never have associated the acquisition of that knowledge with anything nefarious, uh, with anything, you know, um, related to security issues, if you like. I think we would have thought that would have been old hat associated more with Cold War warriors, you know, in, in the kind of peak of anti-communist fervor in the 50s and 60s. We felt we were the new guard, you know, kind of um, uh, gaining this knowledge. What, what's happened to both of us as the years have passed and um, as China has risen is we felt that we've returned back to a period where gaining knowledge about Asia, having intimate relations um, with Asian cultures is, is now seen as potentially problematic. Uh, it's a reason to deny visas. It's a reason to deny security clearances if you work in a public service. Um, you know, we're very struck by this because we were very much part of that wave of optimism and we wanted to understand why it was that stories that to us, media representations that to us, political approaches that to us seemed, you know, from a different era were returning. Um, and that's, I think, the reason that uh, Andrew poses that question in, in the introduction. Was that period an aberration? Um, and if so, what do we do next? Yeah, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Well, that takes us to um, the, uh, the essay, The Ruptured Histories, um, 
And you, you kind of start that essay with a bit of a story about a, a family album from uh, the Weissman family, which um, you, you um, source from uh, Sophie Loy Wilson's private archive <laughs> and you describe it, I think, as a, 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 a demoured archive or something like that. So not quite a burning archive, but certainly a floating mm -hmm. archive. Um, and um, you use that, that um, I guess, personal memoir, sort of souvenir almost, um, as a way of sort of telling a more complicated story about the history of Australia, Asian relationships, um, both the content of that relationship, but also, I guess, the way in which historians tell the history of that that relationship, the the, the manner of storytelling, I guess. Do you want to just, you know, ex say a bit more about, you know, why what that um, family album represented for you, and and uh, the kind of the kind of history making that it enabled for you uh, and you know what was your thinking in, in using that piece of an archive to tell a particular kind of story about Asia Australia relationships but also a particular kind of a, a kind of history a particular kind of historical practice yeah I love this question um, you know, for both of us, what the album represented was a methodological challenge. So how do Australians know Asia? How do they, you know, forget Asia? Uh, and what, what values do they bring to that quest to, to know, to know Asia? For us, we're, we're historians. So we're interested in the relationship between ourselves and the material refuse of the past. So the documents that are left behind, um, the stories that are left behind, the objects that are left behind. In our country, we tell our national history through archives and, and historical documents kept in national collections. So the National Archives, for example, uh, in Canberra, the Australian War Memorial. When we collect these objects, we place value on them. We say this is an important aspect of our national history. Traditionally, objects, documents, stories to do with Asia haven't really been central to our national collections. Uh, the Weizmann album certainly wasn't something that was part of our national collections. What I find so fascinating about this archive, I think it is a burning archive. <laughs> In many ways, it's a burning archive. Yeah. Uh, they, they received this album. It's a beautiful album. Uh, that documents Vietnamese anti-communism in the 50s. 56, 57, beautiful photographs, black and white photographs are taken of Vietnamese people on the street protesting against communism and the Soviet Union. Uh, these photographs are compiled in an album, a uh, beautiful kind of wooden album that, that's handed to Jewish refugees fleeing Europe after the Second World War on their way to Australia, on their way to the new world, right? That world, that new world better be anti-communist <laughs> is sort of what the message is. Now this family- and they were you know, from Hungary, they were from am Hungary. I right? Yeah, yeah, Hungary, yeah. So right. they're, they're, you know, it, it, this is around about 56, yeah. This is a very, very important time for them thinking through, uh, you know, the, the power of the Soviet Union and the spread of communism, right? And, um, you know, these are people that have witnessed total war in, in, in World War II. And so they receive this album and they, they return to Australia and they make a life for themselves in Sydney and they keep the album. It's, you know, from 57 when they arrive, they keep it. And they hand it to me in 2018. Um, you know, their daughter hands it to me, Carol. Uh, and she says to me, this is really important to my parents. I think this is an Australian history. <laughs> <laughs> so what fascinated me was the kind of ways in which this archive developed, developed organically. It was handed to me as someone that they thought had an interest in Asia. I do have an interest in communism and anti-communism. I do. Uh, and, you know, they handed it to me and, and Andrew and I took it as a prompt, you know, to think about the ways in which uh, so many Australians have 
a deeply emotional and complex relationship to objects from Asia, stories from Asia, people from Asia, that I think was grossly simplified in political discourse and I think has the potential to humanise um, relations with Asia, you know, to insert generosity into relations with Asia, to um, enact what Andrew calls a more capacious history of Australia-Asia relations. So we took the album as a challenge to think about what has been incorporated into Australian national history about Asia, but also what has been forgotten. And I guess it's also a story about how um, uh, history just doesn't belong to either historians or to, um, you know, the big national storytellers in politics or whatever. It, it's something everyone can find their own version of a story and potentially a, a much more imaginative and rich story than what you'll find, you know, in the Fairfax Press or the Channel 9 Press or the the, the Murdoch Press as well. So I think it's wonderful. I think your I think. work does that, Jeff. I think podcasts like this yeah. do that. I think that if we are going to um, create a more plural society, a mm. more generous society, it has to be, you know, from a place of historical generosity generosity in storytelling. I think that is the basis of building broader, more generous communities. Mm. I would love it if our politicians could do that for us. Mm. I think unfortunately our political system, its relationship to the media, its relationship to party politics and populism and factionalism means it's unlikely mm. that those capacious, generous stories will come from our politicians, but they can come from us. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that goes to one of the ways you frame uh, the story of Australia-Asia relationships or Australia-China relationships, um, which is, I mean, you know, well, I guess famously, uh, I think it was John Howard who said, you know, uh, China's our economic partner, uh, America's our security partner, and we don't have to choose. Um, but um, and you you say that so often uh, in in the histories, it's it's framed in that those terms of the, I guess, the business relationship or the national security, American alliance type relationship. Um, and I personally wonder whether that's part of the problem that's developed with our, our relationships with China and, and other uh, Asian countries, with India, indeed, maybe even with Russia, in that um, uh, there's been an overemphasis on on the business relationship, I guess, you know, a way, as you were saying, you know, it's a way to make us all rich um, rather than to have a very meaningful set of emotional, cultural connections uh, on a much broader, broader plane. Well, I mean, what do you, what do you think of that I sort of exactly idea? Exactly right. And I'm, 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 I'm fascinated by this as a historian. So as we say in the intro, this is one of, one of my lines, you know, I say that, this issue of national security um, and then, you know, economic rationalism or economic wealth acquisition, you know, these two stories around Asia are like recalcitrant. They're calcified, you know, onto our rhetoric around Asia and they just won't budge. And I've watched this, you know, I'm sure you have too for, for a long time and wondered, wondered about it. Uh, and I, I have sort of like a couple of explanations and, and thoughts thoughts on this. One is that for many Australians, you know, their encounters uh, with Asia began during the era of decolonization, during, you know, the Cold War, and then during the end, in the case of Andrew and myself, at the end of the Cold War. And so this is a time when people are defining their relationships to places on the basis of political systems. You're either communist or you're, you're not. And, and this very polarized way, I think, of viewing the world and viewing the relationship between individuals and societies, uh, I think defined early on Australia's opening up to Asia, you know, as the white Australia policy was being dismantled in the 60s and 70s. So I think the context of the dismantling of the white Australia policy, the context of, of Australian uh, counterculture, Australian baby boomer interactions with Asia laid a certain kind of foundation in which some Australians felt they needed to articulate 
their intimacy with Asia in Cold War terms or through Cold War polemics. So, you know, sympathy with the left or sympathy with the right, if you like. And this is a time when our politicians are talking in this way. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to ban, you know, Australia, we had two referendums to try to ban the Communist Party. And there were two, they both failed. I mean, even Menzies, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Populism himself, you know, kind of like um, more John Howard than John Howard, right? Uh, even he couldn't push through um, these referendums, but they came close to banning the Communist Party. And they, as, as we, we know, very tragically, the, this question ruined careers, ruined lives, ruined marriages, you know, really destroyed people um, in that period. And so I think that the context in which many Australians travelled to Asia, be it on the hippie trail, my, my colleague Agnieszka Sobocinska, who's in this issue, has written extensively about, you know, the, the importance of Australians um, travelling the hippie trail in the 70s and how that formed their view of Asia, or be it a later, a later period in the 80s where many Australian businessmen and women, mostly men kind of went to Asia to make money, right? Uh, I think these, 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 both these kinds of encounters with Asia are framed implicitly by political ideas. One, ideas associated with communism and socialism. Two, ideas associated with a more conservative capitalism. So I think because these encounters were framed by those political ideas, unfortunately, it's bled into our political, you know, discussion and representation of our relations to Asia. However, despite all these things, Many people, I'm sure yourself too, Jeff, have had deeply personal uh, encounters with Asia. Uh, and I don't just mean kind of making friends. I mean being changed by Asian intellectual traditions, being changed by Asian religious ideas, being changed by Asian, you know, um, uh, political challenges to Western hegemony. Many Australians have deeply, you know, emotional stories to tell about their relationships to Asia, or it could be about refugees, Vietnamese refugees coming to this country in the 70s. It could be a more uh, kind of, you know, a uh, story about the sy sympathy um, uh, with, with the victims of wars, many of them Western, you know, kind of motivated wars. I feel like, I feel like these stories, you know, are vital and have the potential to lay anti-war foundations in our society and as i said i think open us up to be more generous folk however for whatever reason we're resistant uh in in our political language and in our history writing to these stories how would you in broad strokes sort of tell the story of australia china relationships. I mean, you know, uh, uh, it, it's interesting because um, it, it, it's like I, I did an appearance on this podcast, the Duran podcast, not so long ago. And, um, you know, there's this genuine sense of surprise from people around the world that things seem to have got so bad between Australia and China in, in just in, like politically, diplomatically in recent years. Um, and even like I did an interview with uh, Felipe Fernandez, Amisto, the sort of kind of world historian, and, you know, he, his perception was, well, surely Australia can be a, uh, uh, you know, a diplomatic broker between Australia and China, or, or, uh, between America and China, and and that would be a good thing for the world. But we just, for whatever reason, don't seem to have got that potential. Um, so how would you kind of sort of tell the broad story of Australia-China relationships um, leading up to this sort of moment of both disappointment, but also in a way a disconnect between what the community, I guess, broadly feels and, you know, what's happening, happening in politics. Yeah, I love this question. Uh, and, you know, I'll preface, preface my answer by, by quoting, um, you know, my colleague, James Curran, who uh, is a political historian at at the University of Sydney and has written a political history called Australia's China Odyssey, you know, kind of about modern relations between Australia and China. And James poses this problematic. He says, we have a very large population now of Chinese Australians, the largest in, in our history, one of the largest in, in, in the Western world. 
Um, we have an established community from Hong Kong, established community from mainland China, established community, uh, you know, from Taiwan, an established community of overseas Chinese that have come via Southeast Asia, for example, after the, the Second World War. These are big, you know, rich communities. Why is it that despite these communities that are well-established, we still have this intense um, anti-Chinese antipathy? Uh, and in fact, during COVID, we saw a rise in anti-Chinese casual racism, racist attacks. I'm sure you saw, I saw some very racist graffiti. For example, it was quite shocking that I would associate more with, you know, the 1890s than I would with today. So James poses this question and he's sort of saying what you're saying, why is the relationship so bad, you know, and why is the relationship so bad? Despite, James is saying, this large group of of, of of Chinese immigrants, what? Um, and I think I think I would say to James, you know, um, I, this has a lot to do with the foundations of our of our country, which, as as many of us know, those foundations are associated with two big movements of people. The first is uh, convict labour and convict transportation, and the second is the gold rushes. So we know that these two very large uh, movements of people from uh you know europe and asia to australia in via convict transportation and via the gold rushes this was the foundation of of australian democracy you know we look back to the relationship between you know convicts and their overseers for for the the kind of what, what we see as the origins of some of our um anti-authoritarian values as a country egalitarian values we look to the gold rushes and Eureka, the Eureka stockade, again, for, you know, a history of Australian egalitarianism and democracy. Whether or not, you know, this is the truth is debatable, but, but these, are, these are symbols for us of our political values as a nation. In both those moments, uh, China was vital. <laughs> so, you know, in the, in the early period of combat transportation, you know, there, there were Chinese, uh, Chinese so-called indentured labourers that, that arrived in this country as well. Um, so-called, you know, coolie labourers that arrived in this country as well. During the gold rushes, the second largest population apart from Europeans was Chinese migrants, famously. So I feel like, you know, uh, Chinese migrants, to, to quote a phrase from Andrew in the introduction, have always been the ghost of the banquet of Australian democracy. <laughs> We've always been there. It's two things I think happened with, with, with this history. One is that Australians began, white Australians began to define themselves against Chinese people. So whether or not they were friends with Chinese people or not, Chinese people became a, a kind of um, a binary, if you like, or a kind of, you know, um, uh, an oppositional mirror in which Australians define themselves as everything Chinese people were not, right? So... If, if Australians wanted to have a more egalitarian society and have an end to convict transportation, that was because Chinese migrants were slaves or, or coolies and worked in terrible conditions. If Australians wanted to argue for trade unions uh, or they wanted to argue for fairer distribution of land against the settlers, well, it was because, um, you know, Chinese migrants worked in terrible conditions for no money, you know, with, uh, in, under a kind of oppressive, op oppressive overseers or headmen. So whether or not this is factual, and I know for a fact it wasn't because Chinese migrants, that's not how they lived, that's not what they did. They became an important foil against which white Australians defined their singularity um, in a situation in which they weren't very singular. They were part, they were kind of an afterthought of the British Empire. <laughs> a pretty unimportant, uninteresting part of a brutal kind of imperial system called the British Empire. And, uh, you know, but they were also, you know, part of a, a community of people that wanted to make a nation. And they were part of, you know, this, this incredible moment in world history after 1848, when people wanted to make a fairer, more egalitarian society via nationalism, via nationhood, and via rebelling against systems that were monarchical and didn't value merit or a meritocracy. So in this moment, Australians are looking for a way to be singular and Chinese migrants have always provided a foil uh, against which they can make themselves look singular. So I, I think this is what's happened. And I think this is why these stories around, you know, Chinese Chinese people or, or Chinese society as threatening to, you know, something something core in our spirituality and our value system prop, prop up all the time and why it's so um, um, powerful politically.
How do you think it's connected to, I guess, the story of the British Empire? Because, um, uh, of course, you know, mid mid nineteenth century, uh, you know, well, all this is happening in Australia, in China. Some very very dramatic <laughs> events are happening with, you know, the Opium Wars and then the, uh, uh, you know, the Taiping Rebellion. The, you know, horrible catastrophic sort of civil war um, that killed a lot of people. Um, uh, but then I guess in more recent times also how Australia connects, I mean, we've lost our attachment to the British Empire, but perhaps we've we've um, attached ourselves very limpet-like to a different uh, world system, the sort of American uh, world system. How, how do you feel that that, that sort of the role Australia plays in those, uh, you know, empires, to use just simple language, um, uh, has affected this whole whole story as well. Oh, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, if you've, if you've read the introduction, you know that one of the big arguments that Andrew and I make is that empire, empire is never gone, right? So the way in which human beings organise themselves in the world it's not like we moved from a period where we were imperial people or part of empires and we were suddenly part of nations. It's not the case. We, we know that we still have empires everywhere, <laughs> you know, whether they be corporate empires or whether they be the American empire or the so-called Chinese empire. Human communities expand out, they conquer, they overtake. They have an imperialist motivation underlying a lot, you know, of their behavior. Empire is everywhere. And so Andrew writes about this in terms of the Japanese empire. He looks at the ways in which Japanese conservatives never forgot their dreams of empire. Even after the horrors of World War II, they held on to these imperial dreams and it motivated their political ideology. It motivated their nationalism. So empire and nation connected, <laughs> number one. You know, number two, Australians were passionately part of the British empire and they modified their thinking, you know, as the empire evolved. So, you know, we look at the, the 1930s, the rise of the new guard in Australia, the rise of fascism in Australia. This was a very kind of imperial moment. These guys were passionate monarchists. Many Australians who would call themselves conservative are still passionate monarchists. They see the British Empire as representing ideas of liberty, freedom, you know, civilization, things that we should all aspire to that they associate with very positive aspects of human community. Others associate empire with oppression, with false hierarchies, with racism, with, you know, kind of like um, ruthless capitalist exploitation and deep human inequality. We have two different views on, on, on these things in, in our world. However, one of the things we propose in the introduction is that when it comes to Asia, uh, Australians haven't ever really de-imperialized, <laughs> in Andrew's words. So if you look at, for example, uh, Australia in, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, which is the period that we, we, we are officially meant to have de-imperialised, de right? Uh, and also culturally de-imperialised. It was a period where a lot of historians were writing about Australian nationalism, kind of the Bushmen, for example. Uh, famously, um, you know, Geoffrey uh, Blaney wrote The Tyranny of Distance, right? You know, all about how far we are from 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 the center of power in london and andrew points out that the tyranny of distance was written right when the tyranny of asia being so near was you know uh, rising as a specter in our in our consciousness so i think that australia we we argue australia australia still you know sees itself in an imperial way that you know the ways in which uh, australia um relates to world powers such as america um, is deeply imperialist in that we see ourselves as a sub-imperial power, uh, you know, working on behalf of a larger imperial presence, Western imperial presence in a hostile Asian region, which is very much, you know, the way that our nation was born, uh, you know, with Federation in, in, in 1901 in relation to the British Empire. This is important because, you know, as you're saying, Jeff, Australia was sort of chosen <laughs> by the British, you know, for some pretty, like, uh, materialistic reasons, you know, because of opium, the opening up of, of China, the forced opening up of China in the opium wars meant that Hong Kong became a British possession. Hong Kong became a British possession. Hong Kong, you know, boomed as a trading port and a shipping port for 
opium, silver, very important node of connection in the British Empire, in fact, vital one, particularly with India, arguably one of Britain's most important possessions, you know, after the fall of America. So, you know, Hong Kong becomes vital and it's from Hong Kong that all the Chinese migrants go to the gold rushes. It's from Hong Kong. That's Hong Kong. So they come via South China. They're from almost all the Chinese gold miners, and this goes for Chinese gold miners in the US, Canada, South Africa, New Zealand, the Pacific, Australia, come from South China. They come from a particular part of South China called Guangdong around the Pearl River Delta. They travel to Hong Kong where all the ships are. The ships are cheap because, you know, they're going all around the world with British goods and things the British Empire. Uh, and they had gone on, they were also, by the way, all those ships were repurposed slave ships right and convict ships <laughs> so they get on these cheap ships and they head off to the gold field and they've gone through hong kong so many of these uh chinese migrants to the settler colonies have british citizenship they're members of the british empire but when they get to australia and australians try to say to them look you know we're going to introduce this particular poll tax to stop you from coming <laughs> they say well yeah but we're british citizens so we are part of the British Empire. There is a, you know, a, a trade treaty, you know, with, with the UK. You know, you, you, need, you need to let us in. And this becomes a huge imperial issue because the British say to, to the Australian colonists, no, you guys need to let them in. And Australian colonists say, no, we are going to start deciding who we let into this country and the manner in which they come. So this notion of having control over... Uh, Chinese migration and that being in tension with British imperial, you know, kind of citizenship is fascinating. And many people argue, Marilyn Lake, that, you know, it was these this perception that the British were taking control of their borders away from Australians that actually motivated Australia to become a nation in the first place. So Australia would never have federated, would never have had the same level of nas nationalism that it did if it hadn't been for that sense that Britain wasn't letting Australia define um, immigration immigration policy. And the reason that Britain felt it needed to let Chinese people in is because of Hong Kong. <laughs> it had been a very kind of like complex relationship with China, having forced China to open up to its trade and, and you know, like converting a large number of Chinese people to opium smoking in the process, right? Uh, Britain had in some ways a moral and political obligation to choose to, to people from Hong Kong. And so I think that... Um, you know, this is a very complex story of cause and effect. And one of the points that Andrew and I make is we need to remember empire in all of this. That as we write about Australian nationalism, we can't forget that Australian nationalism was always, you know, part of an imperial formation, an imperial way of thinking, and in some ways, as you suggest, Jeff, still is. Um, I, I recently uh, began reading uh, John Darwin's book, uh, The Empire Project which I think is subtitled The British World System sometime to, you know, 1970, like 1830 to 1970 or something like that. And one of the themes in that book is is the, you know, the, domin the dominions, the white settler dominions, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa to some degree, um, Canada, were a much more important, like they weren't trivial at all within the British world system. They were actually quite, quite important. Um, and I guess that may, I mean, my hypothesis from that is there's a long tradition in Australia of, um, I guess, political elites within Australia really benefiting from that uh, imperial relationship. and and perhaps um, um, driving uh, hostile attitudes towards Asia in a way that perhaps aren't, aren't it's, it's not all bottom up. A lot of it is also top down. And I think we, we see a lot of that at the moment in the sort of US-China uh, tensions and all that. I love this, Jeff. Yeah. You know, you're really in line with the scholarship. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> There's a man called Phil Griffith, who is a brilliant historian at the mm -hmm. University of Queensland. Mm -hmm. He's made for a long time a kind of controversial argument, which is that the white Australia policy was driven not from the bottom up, so not by Australia, the racism of Australian workers, which traditionally is what we thought. Mm -hmm. the Australian unions were anti-Chinese. Phil says no. He's like, you look at the Australian elite right? So Australian kind of big landowners 
um, you know, conservative politicians of the right, it's actually these guys that are arguing for white Australia because it gives them more control over land, capital and labour. You know, it allows them to use cheap labour when they want. There were always exemptions built into white Australia, by the way, as you know, to allow it still is <laughs> for cheap labour. And so, you know, dehumanising non-white people worked for big capitalists because they could pay them less and control them more, right, and de deny them rights. And so, you know, you're you're making a really, really important point here about method. Do we do we understand uh, Australian political attitudes and Australians Australian relationships with the world um, via a more popular kind of you know uh, social history, labour history, if you like, or do we understand it as a more kind of intellectual elite political tradition from from the top? And I think the answer, as you suggest, is both. Um, and you know the interaction between the two, but you, we, we need to not just look at look at one. We need to understand both of those social forces in equal measure. A, a related theme, I guess, in your in your essay and and your work more broadly is um, this sort of idea of I've used the term transnational um, history, um, and I guess no one seems to be quite <laughs> fixed on terminology, whether it's world history or global history or transnational history or international history, but, but um, you know, I guess in simple terms, not seeing the histories of places in fixed boxes, but being, you know, <laughs> affected by movements of people all around the world and movements of ideas and often in, in quite surprising ways. Um, what what does that sort of perspective on uh, uh, history um, tell us that's different about Australian history and its relationship with Asia, would you say? Oh, love this question. I mean, I think about this a lot because on the one hand, methodologically, it's pretty clear, right? It's like, okay, so one of the famous practitioners of this kind of history was a man called, you know, C.K. Bailey, uh, would have been a student of John Darwin. Uh, mm -hmm. for sure. And, you know, he wrote a lot about, uh, you know, the ways in which events that we think of as very European or American, the American Revolution, you know, uh, revolutions in Europe to do with human rights, um, so-called French Revolution, you know, were deeply connected to non-white parts of the world. Uh, he was drawing on an argument that others have made, um, uh, you know, a number of brilliant historians that looked at the ways in which um, events in Haiti, for example, were vital to the French Revolution. So, you know, Haitians and their uprisings against the French Empire influenced, you know, political ideas in the French Revolution. So the, the idea is very post-colonial, right, transnationalism. It's that, hang on, a, a lot of these events that we see as being, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of stemming from some kind of European consciousness, it's, it's basically about internationalist ways of thinking. It's, you know, do we think about human beings um, as in a universal sense? That we're all connected, um, you know, in a kind of common humanity, or do we think about human beings as anchored into kind of national communities? And it's hard for historians. Historians, like, you know, can't write about everything, <laughs> right? And historians get funding, they get celebrated by national institutions, parliaments, universities, archives, libraries. These are national institutions that want you to tell national stories. So, you don't go to the National Archives and tell a story about, you know, well, all human beings believed in trade unions. You want a story that's like, well, actually, Australia was a leading force for trade unions in the 1890s. You know, we want something to make us singular, <laughs> right? We don't want something that, that necessarily makes us universal. And so I think that transnational history is just another word, really, for international ways of thinking. And, you know, a lot of the political thinkers that I'm sure interest you and I of the late 19th century and, you know, the interwar period are people that thought internationally. They thought about, they thought about political systems as something that all human beings could engage with, regardless of race, class, creed, language. In fact, that was a big part of, you know, the international, you know, international communism, but also international socialism. And also kind of, you know, um, uh, fascism, you know, this idea that we can, we, we can import it everywhere. Uh, then you have a kind of counter idea, which is that, no, human beings are linked to place and that the place they live, the environments they encounter, the folk traditions they carry with them, this is what makes them. This is why they get homesick, you know. And so there are these tensions in historical practice between writing a history of all human beings, 
imperial history lent towards in some ways, right? And writing a history of place. And so transnational historians, the best practitioners of transnational history, try to do both. So they look at how, say, um, the Amritsar massacre, right, where the British shot into huge crowds of, of Indians, um, massacred them in, in Amritsar, inspired Chinese anti-colonialism in the May 4th movement. So Chinese anti-colonials who, there was a famous incident in, in Shanghai in 1925 where the British shot into a crowd of protesters were inspired by an event in India. So we look, they, they look at the way that as technology changed and people could share ideas quicker, like today, people began to think of themselves as more connected and began to be inspired politically by events in far-flung places, um, despite linguistic backgrounds, despite religious and cultural backgrounds. So, you know, the question of how international we are and how connected we are as humans remains open to, to this day. Um, and it is a methodological challenge for historians seeking a more global history of cause and effect. But it, it's it's also, I guess, it's a, um, it's a way of seeing the world, which, I mean, it seems to be um, forcing itself upon us uh, today as, as the influence of countries outside the West is growing um, and, you know, the influence and wealth and all the rest of it. And so increasingly we need to sort of see a more diverse plural world um, and I guess just open up our, our minds to that. So, but in transnational history seems to be for all its challenges and, you know, you, you kind of, it's enough just to learn the history of one country, let alone 200 countries. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think yeah. also Jeff, I think, you know, there's been a return for biography. I think mm. we live in a hyper complex world, probably like you, I like simplicity, you know, and I like something that, you know, allows me to kind of like uh, trace a series of, of, of connections that make sense to me. And so the human scale of, of, of thinking about change, so biography, tracing one life has become hugely popular um, in our in our world for a reason. It's too complicated. We can't, can't keep track of everything. We also want to understand our own values and morality. And I think that the way that we have traditionally done this, look at all religions, is by an individual person you know, look at our religious stories. So I think at the same time as historians are trying to tell these complex stories, uh, you know, of, of transnational interconnection, readers <laughs> are leaning more towards the human scale. Um, and the best transnational history, I think, is written by a woman called Natalie Zeman Davis. Um, and uh -huh. she writes about my favourite historian, one of my favourite historians, Inga Clendenin. She writes about individuals, so she traces mm. the lives of individuals in order to understand these connections. And I think that has been the most successful form and the most empathetic, empathetic form of transnational history. Mm. Mm. Yes. She's fantastic, isn't she? It's been a while since I read Natalie Zeman Davis. I'll have to do a review of one of her books <laughs> on the podcast. Yeah. Won't I? And yeah. you mentioned Inga, Inga Clendinen as well, didn't you? Um, who, who, again, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, writer and and his, well historian anthropologist you know yeah. complex complex thinker i wonder uh if you'd be kind enough to maybe also just suggest a couple of um top books that people might want to read just to get a more uh rich complex um, but also humane sort of picture of whether it's the history of China or history of Australia, China relationships to just um, uh, understand, you know, uh, uh, that part of the world a little bit better today. What, what, because uh, I, I know myself, you know, detached from any sort of university or whatever, sometimes if you just rely on what's in bookshops or, you know, what's obviously there it's a bit hard to find well wh which of these <laughs> books should i read to 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 actually get a, a genuinely fresh original perspective on things what are a couple of uh, one to three you know books you'd really recommend on oh, yeah. opening up people's minds to a different perception of china asia or oh, australia wonderful. china relationships wonderful question i have three <laughs> um you know, I'll start. I'll start with uh, um, a local 
a local example, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to examples from China. I, I, I do think that um, memory uh, and, you know, books that, that deal with the complexity of, of, of human memory, both personal and political, are wonderful ways into human societies uh, because they're not polemic. They don't take a position of, uh, of argument at the beginning. They're not trying to convince you of something. And I think if you're interested in political theory and you're interested in political systems, then sure, like the polemics are good. But if you want a kind of entree to context, to society, um, uh, I think memory is better. So I recommend South Flows the Pearl by Mavis Gokian, uh, published by Sydney University Press. It's quite affordable. Mavis Gokian was a Chinese Australian. Her mother was uh, English uh, from Perth. Her father was Chinese, born in the 1890s in Perth, became really inspired um, by communism in the 30s, joined communist movements in China, lived in China, married a communist cadre. And then because of her mixed race background and her capitalist background was imprisoned in the Cultural Revolution. Ultimately, she returned to Australia on an ancestry visa with her daughter, Shaman, who lives around the corner from me in Ashfield. A few years ago, Shaman uncovered a manuscript her mother had written. Her mother had gone around in the 80s and 90s in kind of yam chai restaurants, in homes, interviewing her community of Chinese Australians about their lives. And what she found was incredible because she was part of the community and they trusted her. They revealed like their secrets basically to her. And so you have an incredible entwined history of Australia uh, and China at, at this time. And it, it's the story of democracy, communism as well. And it, it's a really incredible book. So South Flows the Pole is one I would recommend. Um, the second um, book I would recommend is Red Memory by Tanya Brannigan, which just blew my mind. Again, this is a book based on a lot of oral history. So Tanya Brannigan, you know, asked the question, why is it that so many people's lives in China today are defined by this one event? And she's correct. And she shows that the Cultural Revolution was so seismic, so traumatic. It, it, it went so deep into families and, you know, human psychology that it has absolutely shaped modern China to this day, partly because it's so difficult to talk about. Uh, some people want to talk about it all the time and some people never, ever want to talk about it. So the book's brilliant because she goes around China and she, she sits with different people, be it people that run museums to the Cultural Revolution, be it people that are trying to uncover graveyards to those that were killed, you know, be it those who, who were involved in the killings. You know, one of the chapters is about a, a son who kills his mother. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. And it's, it's, um, it's just beautifully written with a lot of compassion and it's frankly unput downable. So I would recommend, uh, South Flows the Pearl and Red Memory. The third book I would recommend is Oracle Bones by Peter Hessler. So Peter Hessler, Oracle Bones by Peter Hessler. Okay. So Peter Hessler was, uh, uh a journalist that spent a lot of time in China uh, from the 1990s um, to today. He wrote a book called Rivertown, which, which I would also recommend about teaching English uh, in the area of the Three Gorges Dam uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, um, introducing a lot of Western texts to his students. Um, he also wrote about Oracle Bones. Oracle Bones is a, is a history of China because Oracle Bones were very early um, kind of devised, used by Chinese emperors to divine the future um, in the, from the Shang, Shang Dynasty. And um, he goes right up to today. And again, it's, it's, it's a lot of using a lot of oral history. He talks to a lot of people, but he, it's just a very compassionate book and it's got really rich case studies. Um, and he never simplifies the story. He tries to understand, you know, what, what modern China is and frankly, who he is as well as a Westerner in China. So I would argue that, yeah, these books, so South Flows the Pearl, Red Memory and Oracle Bones are, are books that, you know, your, reader, your, your listeners would really enjoy. I think I actually even did a little review of um, Red Memory on the um, on the show as well um, uh, a couple of months back, um, but, uh, and I thought it was it was great. But uh, it's such a powerful event, the Cultural Revolution, and I, I know I've had I've, I've read a few things about it, and you know there are some marvelous, marvelous films about it as well, uh, both you know like documentaries, but also like artistic films, 
Uh, and it would be, oh, I mean, that'd be a great topic for another conversation, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Because you know, it's I, such an extraordinary, uh, just a human uh, experience uh, beyond understanding China. It's 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 an extraordinary human experience as well. Absolutely. And I would love to talk more about it. And I think the yep. Bernie Archive is a really great analogy for mm. the memory of the Cultural Revolution in China, you know, partly because so many families burnt their archives, literally, mm. to mm. destroy any evidence of... Um, bourgeois or capitalist background or anything problematic or just because they were fearful anything would be interpreted you know in the wrong way and secondly because the, the pain the anger and the trauma still burns mm. you know for people today they are their own burning archives walking around with the stories you know that they have from that time and um the reason i'm a historian actually is i when we arrived in beijing in, in 95 uh, we were living on Dungjimin Wai, which is the same street as Tiananmen Square. And my father pointed out of the car, this di black diplomatic car we were in, and he pointed to all these bikes. And there were, you know, people on many, many bikes. And he said, anyone over 40, Sophie, would have lived through Wenhua Da Geming or the Cultural Revolution. And and I was 11. And this thought, I just read Wild Swans, this thought that everyone around me lived through this event. It was like seeing a million Holocaust survivors walking past me. You know, I just thought, what? Um, and how do you move on from such an event? So I would love to discuss it. And I'm so glad that you did a Tony Brannigan special. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you, Sophie. That's a fantastic, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for uh, appearing on the Burning Archive and um, uh, taking the metaphor of the burning archive into into your own thinking it's it's really um very gratifying that's all right and i just want to thank um uh the uh, kate fuller and ben mountford who are the official editors of history australia and all the contributors as well to to the journal and do go and read it if you can it's um just historyaustralia.com yeah. fantastic <laughs>